Good morning. On behalf of the congregation of St. Paul's United Church of Christ here in Canonsburg, Pennsylvania, we welcome you to our uh, worship service this morning. Uh, we apologize for the delay. There were a few things beyond our control. So we are, you're probably noticing things look a little different. Um, we have gone back at, for this Sunday to uh, recording the service on the phone. Uh, and so we will We'll continue to work on things, and hopefully uh, next by next Sunday we'll have that back, being able to use the camera and all that good stuff. Um, th because this is the first Sunday in Advent, I would like to remind you to have your Advent wreath and candle or candles ready. Uh, at the beginning of the service, we will light the first Advent candle, and what we hope is that you will join us at home and you will light your candle at home as well and participate in the responsive reading and, uh, and a special song. Um, if you need any supplies along that line, please let us know in the office and we'll see about getting them to you. Hopefully you have all received your epistle at this point. You will hopefully you have had a chance to at least get an overview of it and you'll take note that there are a number of events happening during this month. We hope that you will be able to participate in them as best as you are able. Um, we have organized two times to sing together outside, and we're hoping that uh, as many people as possible will be able to join us in that way so we can, uh, we can follow the restrictions, but we can also see each other during this month, in which we have so many memories and so many traditions that we want to, to share as best as we can with each other. We ask now that we might each and all join our hearts and spirits in worship. Through God. 
understands our desire for a quick fulfillment of our hope in God's promises. God forgives us when we either try to force God's hand or make up our own descriptions of what those fulfilled promises will look like and when they will occur.
with, in person or in spirit, and pass the peace of Christ. Peace. Be with me. Peace. Peace. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace. This morning, our work for the young is about waiting. I don't know about you, but I am not really a big fan of waiting. <laughs> I get pretty impatient very quickly. I don't know if that's true for you or not, too, but I think for a lot of us, probably, sometimes it's really hard to wait. And lately, we've had an especially tough time. I think maybe before the pandemic, we would have said we were impatient. But now, we really know, we really know what it's like to wait, to not be able to do things that we wish that we could be doing, and to wait. And so, part of what Advent is about, this is this new season, this new church season that starts today, when Shirley lit our, our first Advent candle. Part of what that's about is knowing that something is coming. Something's coming in the future, but it's not quite here yet. And so we have to wait. We have to hold on and wait. But that doesn't mean that we just kind of throw up our hands and say, oh, you know, it'll never come. I just, this is terrible. This is awful. I'm bored. I, I don't know what to do. Because we don't have to do nothing while we wait. We could prepare. We could get ready. We could imagine the incredible things that are about to happen in the world. And we can figure out how we might be able to be a part of that, part of that new breaking in of, of something, some mystery that we're not entirely sure of, but we know that it's going to be amazing. I was thinking about um, when I'm at a traffic light, a stoplight. You guys know traffic lights, the lights on the road and at the Top is a red light, and then there's a, a yellow light and a green light. And sometimes I get really frustrated when I get to a red light. It's like, oh, come on. I just want to go. Why won't you let me go? But the new thing that I'm trying to do now is when I'm at a red light, instead of getting frustrated that I have to wait and wonder when I'm going to go, I take that time, I take a deep breath, I think, you know what, this is a moment, a free moment in my day when I can look around and, and see how God is happening in the world right then. It's a gift. I don't, I don't pay for it or anything. It's just given as long as we, as we take it. So while we're waiting and waiting and waiting for things that we know are going to come but they're not quite here yet, take a moment and look around and take a deep breath and realize that every moment, every second of the day is a gift. And we can either be impatient and throw that gift away, or we can realize it, and we can savor it, value it. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for giving us this time of, of waiting so that we can practice noticing all the times that you show up in our life, but we're so often looking away and rushing on to the next thing. Grant us patience, grant us curiosity, and the ability to stop and look around and take a deep breath. Amen.
So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Here ends the Gospel readings. Please listen for the word of God as it is found in the book of Psalm. Psalm, Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7 and 17 through 19. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Massena. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Restore us. O Lord God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. Here ends the reading of the psalm. May God bless our hearing and living of these words. We are 
waiting specifically for Christmas and the celebration of God coming into the world and the person of Jesus. But there's a bigger, a bigger sense of waiting that we're experiencing and we're trying to focus on. And, and thus, we have a number of different passages from Scripture that focus on, on what people are doing and what they're talking about and how they're thinking about waiting. As a species, as human beings, we're not very good at waiting. Alyssa mentioned her impatience on occasion of at stoplights or different things like that, but I think if we're honest, we can all say that there are numerous times that we are get very impatient, that waiting, even for small things, is really, really hard for us. Because we want what we want, and we want it now. Let me assure you, the difficulties that we had with our technology this morning were not a plant. We were not trying to force you to have to wait so you could experience this season tangibly. But think about how you felt. Think about your reaction. You went on Facebook. Our live service is supposed to be there, and it's not there. What do I do? What's wrong? What's going on? Look, I booked an hour, or maybe a little bit longer for this, and if it hasn't started, what am I going to do? I, you know, and, and just think, think for a second about how you reacted. I would imagine, I mean, if I was sitting in your shoes, I would imagine I, I would be feeling various different types of frustration and be wondering, come on, come on, when is this going to happen? like it's supposed to happen. Now, just so you know, I don't know if, if there is a parallel, but while you were waiting and wondering what was going on, there were a whole bunch of people here, well, not a whole bunch, two, four, six, six of us, two, four, six, yeah, six of us, trying to figure out what we were going to do and how we were going to make it work. There was all this activity going on. Well, the camera in the back's not working. Maybe we can use the phone, but we have to get at this, this, that. I wonder if that's not a part of what we don't always realize is happening while we're waiting. Is that there's a whole lot of other things going on trying to uh, help happen what we're waiting for. And yet we are just stuck in this thing of why isn't this happening at this moment when I want it to happen. Now the writers of the two readings that Shirley shared with us, both the writer of the Gospel of Mark and the writer of the Psalm, are talking about waiting. And they're expressing some frustration about having to wait and what it is that they want, what it is that they want and are hoping for, how it's not happening. Now, they're, they've been waiting longer than a few minutes like we had to this morning. They've been waiting in, in, uh, in the case of the, the writer of the psalm perhaps for hundreds of years. Um, the Gospel of Mark, 75 years or so. It's a long time. It's a long time to not have your hope fulfilled. It's a long time. And, and you're wondering, and they're wondering, when is it that God is going to act as God, as they believe that God is going to act? And when we wait, the longer we wait, the greater the temptation is for us to uh, make predictions, to say that this is, this is what's going to happen and this is how it's going to happen. We heard that very clearly in the, in the gospel reading from Mark about this, these signs that are going to take place, and and then uh, and then what it's going to look like when when Jesus returns, and, and what all is going to happen. But I think in focusing on all that, we are missing 
some of the crucial points of what is, is being shared in these scripture passages. The third, our third scripture passage is similar. And so I would ask that as we are listening, listening for the word of God as it's found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, reading from reading the 64th chapter, that we might we might ask ourselves, what is being shared with us? What, what insights are being offered to us as we hear what the writers are, are, are so frustrated about and want so badly to happen? Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when a fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for you. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgress. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our God. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our ancestors praised you, has been burned by fire and all our pleasant places have become ruins. After all this, will you restrain yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and punish us so severely? May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is writing to the, to the Jewish people, some who are still in exile and who have been in exile for hundreds of years, but also to people who have been able to finally return from that exile. And they have come back to Israel, they have come back to Jerusalem to find their country, their city, devastated, leveled. And they are wondering What's happened? How has this happened? They are wondering how this could have been, how, how God could have let this happen. And so the writer, this writer, Isaiah, or, or one of his followers, speaks and tries to, to define what it is or why it is that this has happened. That God has, has, is angry with the people of Israel. That God has, has chosen to hide oneself from the people of Israel. And that's why all of this has happened. And, and, and so they're praying, hoping that God will come down and make it all better. This is a common theme that runs through our scriptures, both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament scriptures. This desire for God to make it all better, to come in these incredible deeds that make everybody 
shake in their boots. Thunder, lightning, stars falling, clouds covering the sun so it's darkness as in the middle of the day. These, these visions that this is how God is going to transform the world and that we need to be keeping an eye out for those sorts of things because that's a sign that God has, is coming back. That's a sign that God is going to exercise God's power in the world and make it so uh, the world is as God has dreamed it to be. And of course, the people of Israel, the early Christians, believe that they will be the beneficiaries of this transformation that God is going to bring about. The Gospel writer Mark goes even further to predict, to say, mention specific signs about what's going to happen, and even when it's going to happen, within the generation of, of people who are hearing what he's saying, what he's writing. And we know that these predictions, these visions, these hopes, didn't come true in the way that these writers were hoping. Predictions like these are our attempt as human beings to somehow control God, to make God do what we want, and further to make God act within the time frames in which we want. And there's a certain expectation that if God loves us, then God will do that. The problem is, that's never how God has worked. If we look more deeply into Scripture, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, we come to recognize that God doesn't act in these huge, spectacular ways, but much more often in quiet, subtle ways, in surprising ways, in mysterious ways. For our God is an unpredictable and mysterious God. We have no control over God. The incense that was offered, the, uh, the offerings that were brought forward, the animal sacrifices, were all the different ways that we attempt to, to bribe God or manipulate God or, or get God to do what we want God to do. That's never worked. It's not how God functions. And yet we continue to hope that that will be the case. We continue to insist that this will be the case. And so we listen to these sorts of predictions. The end of the world is coming on this day. Jesus is coming back on that day, and God's going to come and flip everything around on this day because we want to know, we want some control, and we don't want to wait anymore. But that's not how it works. It's never how God's worked. It's not how God is working now, and it's not how God is going to work in the future. Rather, rather, as we hear the gospel more, we have to stay awake and alert to what is actually happening around us right now. Because if we do pay attention, we do find some signs of God at work in our world. They're quiet signs. They're subtle signs. But they're there we're willing to pay attention. <coughs> it's interesting that we light one candle to signify hope. One candle. How much light does one candle give? If it was entirely dark in here, would we all be able to see by the light of that one candle? Well, not particularly well, no. But what would it cause us to do, or what would it ask us to do? It would ask us to pay very, very close attention to where we're walking, what 
what's around us. Because the light of one candle does shed light, but it requires of us to be aware, to be alert. This is what God is hoping we will do. Be awake, be alert. When we when we put our when we put our hope in huge events and in God taking care of everything and transforming, we miss the opportunities to change the world in the way that God is asking us to, urging us to. We miss the opportunity, or we miss those quieter and subtler signs that can remind us that God is in the world and that God loves us and God will care for us and seeks to comfort us and is seeking to work through us to change the world so that it is a better place for one and for all, not just for a few. Can we look at one candle and be reminded of that? Can we hear the cry of one child and be reminded of that? Because it's through one child that we got to see a, a whole new vision for how life could be and a whole new vision for how it is that we could work in the world. A vision that had been talked about and shown that Jesus incorporates in a way that, yes, as human beings, we could be in the world. There's not much light in the sunrise, but it offers us the reminder that a new day is before us. Can we draw hope from that? Our faith is not built on huge events. It doesn't, it's not, doesn't demand that great things happen, that miracles occur for us on a day in and a day out basis for, it, for us to have faith and for us to build on that faith. Rather, our faith is built on remembering that God indeed is with us, has been, is, and will be, and that if we are able, willing, to stay awake and alert, we will see the signs that that is true. One candle lit, the cry of a child, the rays of the sunrise, voice of one reaching out to us, a meal that's shared, a hand that's offered to help us up, a thank you that's offered by a stranger or perhaps a loved one. Each and all of these things are signs that God is present and working in the world we have to pay attention. We have to be awake in order to notice them and believe in them. We have to be willing to wait and in that waiting be alert to all that's happening around us. The light of one candle is not a great deal of light but if we look, if we look within its glow, we are reminded that God has brought light into the world and is continuing to do that. We are reminded that we need to look closely for where God is working. And we are reminded that God works through single individuals, each of us, all of us, this community and potentially the whole of the world to bring about this, the visions that we long for. 
the world that we've longed for. In our way, let us be awake and aware, looking closely within the light that's present. As we enter into the spirit of prayer, I ask that we might that we might keep all people during this Advent season in our prayers that they might indeed, that we might indeed find hope. We pray too that there are more and more people who will be who will pay attention to the the rules, the restrictions, the roles that we can play as to how it is that we can slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus. We pray for all those who are in the hospital, for families, their families and friends, the healthcare workers, as, our, as this virus continues to surge. We ask, too, for particular prayers for Sue Mullen's sister-in-law's family. They have all developed COVID, which is on a ventilator in the hospital. Tony and Linda are in the hospital, and Terry and Yolanda are at home. We pray for Myra and Diana, who live in Nicaragua, and all the people who lived there with them following the two hurricanes that had come through through that country and through much of that area, bringing much devastation with it. We'll pray for Candy and Corky. Corky, who continues to have intense pain issues in her back, been determined surgery is needed, but it needs to be delayed because of the, the surge in COVID. We pray for Donna and her daughter, Kathy, and their whole family. After, after Kathy's husband, Donna's son-in-law, Tom, died suddenly from a heart attack this past week. We pray for Beth, who tested positive for COVID-19 and is recovering. And she asked that not only we might pray for her, but also for all the nurses, the CNAs, the lunchroom workers, the cleaning staff, and all the staff at her facility, but also at all the other facilities around, us, around the state, around the country, where there are these intense COVID outbreaks. May people be healed, and may we continue to look for ways to, to stop these outbreaks from happening. Pray for Carol, who's still battling an ongoing infection. Pray for Carol, whose surgery went well and whose healing is beginning. Pray for Rick, who is doing better in Fenton. And we pray for all of Joan Quick's family, her daughters and their families. Following Joan's sudden death this past week. We do have celebrations that we would like to raise up, or even as we as we look around and we see those who are hurting and suffering and ill, we also recognize that there are people who are doing all that they can to help them, and also others who are doing all that they can to help us to find visions of hope. We say thank you to, to Yanni and all our crew for the decorations here in the sanctuary. 
while it will not be an advent like others we have experienced in the past, it will be advent, and we will do what we can to celebrate it together. We also give thanks for Shirley and her reading and being willing to light the candles, the candle for us this morning, reminding us that that hope, hope can seem like not much more than a small light, but if we pay attention to it, that can show us so much more. Let's join our hearts and spirits in prayer. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for your presence within us and amongst us here. And while we want you to do so much more, God, we want you to take care of everything. We recognize that that is not how you work. It's not up to us to control you. But help us not to give up. Help us not to give up on you, to believe that you're hiding from us or are angry from us or are with us but rather that you are working and you're working through us in small and quiet and subtle ways that you're seeking to bring the care and compassion the love this world needs more and more into being help us to see those small and subtle signs of hope help us to be awake and alert to their presence and aware of how you are speaking to us, calling to us, asking us to participate in the work that brings hope to the world. We believe we hear all the prayers we offer to you aloud and also all the prayers we offer to you in silence. And so now we turn to you in that silence. gracious and holy God, we, we give you thanks for our faith that teaches us that you hear all our prayers and you respond to them all. May we receive the care, the compassion that you offer to us. May we hear the calls you present to us. May we experience the peace and the love share with us. And gratitude for all these gifts you share with us. May we choose to share them all with the whole of your world, with each and every person. We offer you this prayer and all our prayers in your most gracious and holy name and in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
time of great waiting. As we experience the pandemic, as we experience its current surge, we long for, we long for God to intervene and make it all go away. We want God to just stop it, to cure the virus, to make all people well, to reunite families and friends, to let us get back to normal. But that's not how it works. And because we have grown impatient, we do not always see the signs of where there is hope. But there is. Vaccines are being developed. And there is a real hope that one and all will be able to receive that. We are witnessing people who are taking greater responsibility, who, who understand now that what we do as individuals has an impact on the wider community. And we need to make a choice to care for that wider community. We see, we see that people are understanding that being united is necessary. And when we allow others to divide us, it does no one any good, except perhaps one or two or a few. Let us look for these signs of hope. Let us believe in them. And let us find how it is that we, each of us, single individuals are being called by God to make these hopes and other hope a reality. One light can be enough. day 